Okay, um, so let's uh, remind ourselves where we left off last time. So last time we started with uh, looking at the GPS signal model, which is uh, given by uh, this equation. Uh, pretty straightforward, so it's like uh, uh, a signal that is modulated uh, with the in-phase and a quadrature component. There is a carrier frequency F sub C, so you have cosine 2 pi F C T for uh, uh, the carrier of the in-phase, and then the uh, quadrature is sine 2 pi F C T. And then there is uh, two signals basically being uh, uh, simultaneously modulated on top of the carrier. There is an X, uh, which is a ranging code, and there is a D, which is a navigation signal. And uh, we said that the range encodes are typically modulated very fast, so from a megabit per second to tens of megabit per second. And uh, the navigation signals are uh, modulated very slowly, so uh, tens of bits per second, like 50 bits per second, 100 bits per second, uh, they're, they're slow. And just by uh, uh, the virtue of the, the, this uh, major difference between the, uh, the modulation speeds, the, the, the receiver can basically distinguish like what's X and what is, what is D. And uh, we talked about some uh, pretty boring but important stuff, which was like different, different ranging codes, and uh, uh, um, some of them uh, were the legacy signals, which are still being transmitted, and then the uh, modern signals. So this uh, course acquisition and the PY are the civilian and, and, and military uh, legacy uh, uh, ranging codes. And then we have the M, M, L1C, L2C, and L5, which are the modern versions, basically. And uh, then uh, we talked a bit about the navigation signals. Um, so uh, again, there is the, the legacy, which is LNAV, and then there is the military and civilian uh, uh, modern uh, navigation signals, uh, MNAV and CNAV. And these navigation signals, what's important uh, about them is that uh, these are basically their uh, human understandable uh, uh, information in it. So it's, it's kind of like uh, data packets with messages that are things like date, time, the satellite status is in there. And then uh, two uh, very important parts of each navigation uh, signal uh, uh, packet is what is called the ephemeris, which, uh, uh, as we'll see today, uh, tells the receiver about the satellite position in orbit, because the receiver needs to know that. And then there's uh, what is called the almanac, which, is, uh, which gives basically the status and some low-resolution orbital information about the rest of the uh, satellites in the, in the constellation. Okay, um, any questions on this before we continue? Okay, so today the topic is uh, basically there's, there's two things um, which are hopefully not, not boring. I think these are exciting stuff and very important. One is uh, we're going to talk about uh, the, 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 the satellite orbits and specifically how this uh, ephemeris information is used to find the satellite uh, location in orbit. And then we will talk about these ranging codes and the, the, the mathematics behind them and how they actually uh, are used to find time of flight uh, um, information and then ranges. Okay, so uh, let's uh, get started with uh, the satellite orbit. Um, so what's important generally when it comes to sensing and uh, then specifically for the GPS is that whenever there is uh, um, uh, a sensor that's operating and there's some sensing information coming in, uh, we should specify what coordinate system was used for the measurements or what reference frame was used. And it's, this is very important, especially in robotics, because you have multiple sensors on, on, a, on a robot and each sensor has its local reference frame. And sometimes you need to like translate information between different reference frames of different sensors. For the GPS, it's a slightly more complicated because it's a distributed system. So you have your receivers on the Earth. Um, uh, which is rotating, right? And then you have these satellites in orbit that are not bound to the Earth coordinates directly, okay? So that's why uh, we need to be very careful about the coordinate systems and the reference frames. So specifically, there are three uh, uh, coordinate systems associated with, with the GPS that we'll talk about. The first one is uh, the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed uh, uh, coordinate system, or the geocentric uh, system, as it's called. And it's a, uh, it's a Cartesian coordinate system so you get the X, Y, Z. And the way it works is that it's centered at the center of mass, mass of the Earth. 
and then the x-axis points to uh, the prime meridian or, or uh, the, the, the zero degree longitude. Your y-axis points to 90 degree east and the z-axis points to the geographical north pole. And this coordinate system, the reason it's called Earth fixed is that it rotates with Earth. That's very important. So if you are on the surface of the Earth and you're not moving, your geocentric coordinates will not change over time because your coordinate system is kind of uh, rotating with, with Earth. So it's not an inertial uh, coordinate system. Uh, so, uh, so this is the coordinate system that the GPS uses when it's doing localization. Uh, it, it basically solves the equations in this coordinate system and finds an XYZ location um, for, for the receiver. Now, for historical purposes, when it comes to mapping on the Earth, uh, people, because the Earth is, is uh, not a flat surface, uh, it's, it's, it's actually an ellipsoid, uh, people used a different coordinate system, which is a polar system, and that's the latitude, longitude, and height system. So for instance, if you look at any map, let's look at a quick one together. So this uh, grid that you see on the map, um, this is not a Cartesian. This, this is your, you have basically your uh, latitude and longitude angles uh, with respect to a coordinate system that is called geodetic. So for this reason, uh, any GPS, after it solves the uh, equations and finds the uh, x, y, z position, it needs to translate it to this system and find the latitude, longitude, and the height. So it, it becomes basically compatible with the maps that exist. So if, for instance, if you want to, if you go to Google Maps, and you want to like find uh, uh, where uh, uh, something is, it doesn't take X, Y, Z from you. It, it asks for latitude and longitude, right? So that's how maps work. And then every receiver needs to basically, after finding the Cartesian coordinates, translate it to this uh, polar coordinates. So the geodetic uh, uh, system, again, uh, so uh, for, for any position, um, uh, with, with the geocentric, it's an XYZ, it's, it's a Cartesian system. And then in the geodetic coordinates, you get a lambda that is uh, your uh, longitude, a phi that is the latitude. So these are two angles, right? And then there is an H, which is the height uh, from the surface of the Earth, okay? Uh, now, very, very important about the geodetic system is the fact that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. Right? So when you want to work with these uh, coordinates, you need to have a model of the geometry of the Earth, which is an ellipsoid, as we know. Uh, there's different models that have been developed which very accurately basically describe the, the shape of the Earth. Uh, specifically, the one that most GPS systems use is called the World Geodetic System 1984, or WGS 1984. There is a lot of information in this. If you look it up, there's, there's like a ton of stuff about like the geometry of the Earth. It even describes the gravitational field around the Earth and so on and so forth. But what's important for GPS systems is basically just the shape of uh, this uh, ellipsoid, which is described by a major and a minor axis. Uh, so A and B, the exact values are given here. And then from there, you can also calculate an eccentricity, which is like uh, how, um, uh, how much it deviates from a perfect sphere, basically. That's, that's what the, the E is, okay? Um, so let's look uh, um, graphically like how, how these two coordinate systems or reference frames are, are related. So here, <clears throat> uh, there is a picture of the ellipsoid, which is the Earth. And then uh, relative to this, let's first look at our geocentric system, which is these blue axes. So there's an X, there's a Y, and there's a Z. And as I said, the X points towards your prime meridian or zero degree longitude. Your Y axis points to 90 degree east uh, longitude. And the Z axis points to the geographical north. And again, remember that this one rotates with Earth. It's an it's a Earth fixed uh, system. Now, if you have some point, let's zoom in into uh, this point, you have some position PR that is not exactly on the surface of, of this ellipsoid, okay? Um, um, so this one in the geocentric coordinates, it has an XYZ. And the way it uh, basically you can find the geodetic or the polar coordinates of it, the height is basically just the distance from this uh, point to the surface of, of the ellipsoid, right? Now, if you extrapolate this line that is perpendicular to the surface, uh, so that becomes this orange line, and then we are just gonna continue it at some point, it's going to intersect your uh, basically equatorial plane, 
right? And it's very important. You see this line does not go through the center of, uh, center of mass of the Earth. This is not an error in the, in the graphics. This is because it is an ellipsoid, right? Uh, if it was a perfect sphere, the line would go through the center. Uh, now, you continue this line, and the angle it makes with the equatorial plane, that is your uh, latitude, so that's the phi. And then the lambda is if you uh, basically uh, project down this point to, the, uh, uh, to your uh, xy plane, um, then the angle it makes here, that is your lambda or longitude. Okay, so this is graphically how the two coordinate systems are related. Again, remember that you get uh, out of, we'll see, uh, out of solving your GPS equations, you get Cartesian coordinates in geocentric uh, reference frame, and then you need to translate them or convert them to the geodetic so you, to get the latitude, longitude, and height, and then you can use any map of the Earth and find where you are on the map. That's, that's how it works. So there's equations for going uh, basically back and forth between the two reference frames or the two uh, coordinate systems. Here are the equations uh, to go from the geodetic to geocentric, which is not what the receiver does, right? So the receiver needs to go the other way around. It finds things in geocentric coordinates and it needs to go to geodetic. But I've included these, just, just so you know, uh, pretty straightforward. So this is like uh, just plug in numbers, basically. So say you have your, uh, your longitude Latitude lambda, your latitude phi, and your height h. And then there is uh, this radius of curvature that you can calculate. That's the radius of curvature at the point you are uh, on Earth. That's n. And you just plug in everything into these three equations, and you get your x, y, z, which is the coordinates in the geocentric uh, coordinate system. Uh, pretty straightforward. And this is pure geometry. I mean, the uh, picture you saw in the, in the slide before, you can basically, if you do some geometry carefully, you can derive this. Not that you have to, but there's really no magic here. It's just uh, pure geometry. Now, as I said, what the receiver needs to do is the other way around. So it needs to go from the geocentric to the geodetic coordinate system. And, and these are the equations for it. Uh, so you have your x, y, z and you want to translate them to lambda phi and h. Uh, lambda, the longitude is easy. It's just the arctan of uh, basically y over x. We're doing the arctan 2 just to take care of the fact that lambda can uh, be anywhere from 0 to 360. So you have to take account for the sine of x and y uh, to, to be able to tell in which quadrant you fall, basically, uh, on the plane. Now, phi and h, it's a slightly more complicated because if you look at these two equations, the phi depends on the h in this very nonlinear ma manner. So it has arctan, and inside the argument, there's h. And also, h, uh, in a very nonlinear way, depends on your phi. So your, uh, basically, your uh, longitude and height are, uh, or latitude and uh, height are very uh, nonlinearly coupled. So it's not like you can just plug in numbers and go from geocentric to geodetic. To do uh, the conversion, you need to solve this nonlinear uh, system of equations. Uh, not a big deal, really. You can use any, any type of you know, iterative solver like Newton's method or something like that to iteratively solve for it. And that's actually what the receiver does um, to go from your x, y, z to lambda, phi, and h. OK. so. That's about the, the first two coordinate systems. There's one more that I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, but now, this was about the receiver side of things. Let's talk about the, the satellite that's, uh, that's in orbit. Um, so uh, as we know, the receiver needs to calculate the accurate uh, position of the satellite. And as the satellite is orbiting the Earth, there is a number of forces that affect its uh, basically trajectory. The main one is gravity. Right? It's the gravitational force of the Earth is the main one that affects how this satellites uh, move. Now, there are a number of secondary forces which perturb these, uh, uh, basically the main force, uh, that is the, uh, the, the, the gravity of the Earth. And, and the secondary effects, uh, they vary with time. So these are not like constant forces. They, over time, they can, they can change. Um, some of these are, for instance, the gravitation of moon and sun can affect your satellite. Uh, things like solar radiations uh, can affect it. Uh, an effect called outgassing, which is this unintentional slow release of gases from the satellite, can affect its uh, trajectory. Uh, tidal variations on the Earth can uh, affect the, the, the forces on the satellites and affect their trajectories. And finally, 
actually um, uh, some intentional orbital maneuvers that the satellite can do to, to course correct basically will of course affect its, its trajectory. So all of these need to be factored in when it comes to finding the position of the satellite in orbit. Now, as, as I said, uh, the satellite tells you where it is. So as part of these navigation messages, it's, there's this ephemeris uh, uh, part which tells you where the satellite is. But the satellite uh, uses a different uh, reference frame uh, to, to basically tell you. Because again, it's not bound to the Earth, it's, it's moving in space, it does not make sense for the satellite to use a geocentric, for instance, coordinate system that rotates with the Earth. So the satellite uses a coordinate system called Earth-Centered Inertial, or ECI, which is exactly like the ECEF, except it does not rotate with Earth. So it's a Cartesian coordinate system. It's centered at the center of mass of the Earth, but the XYZ coordinates always point to fixed direction with, uh, with respect to uh, stars and, and, and other constellations. So it's, it's an inertial uh, coordinate system. And then the satellite, when, it, 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 when you decode that uh, or, or uh, read that ephemeris data, the, the position of the satellite is in the ECI coordinate system, and then the receiver translates that to the geocentric, so it's consistent with uh, basically what it needs to do. Okay, any questions? So again, three, three coordinate systems we talked about, right? The geocentric is the one that the GPS uses to solve for the position, as we'll see. There is the geodetic, which is for historical reasons, it's this latitude-longitude system that maps use. So the GPS, after it finds the, uh, the, coordinate, the position, it translates it to that. And then the ECI is the one that the satellite uses when it tells you where it is. And then you need to go from ECI to ECF uh, before you use that uh, positional information in the satellite. OK. So let's talk about some uh, uh, physics or orbital mechanics of, of, of the satellite. So assume that uh, your satellite's position is given by a, vec a three vector P sub S, which is X, Y, Z uh, position of the satellite in the ECI coordinate system, okay? And first, uh, let's talk about the ideal case. So if Earth was a perfect sphere with uniform mass density, um, and there were no other perturbing forces, so it was only the, the, the gravitational force of this perfect sphere acting on the satellite, its dynamics would be basically governed by uh, uh, the, the Newton's law of motion, which is force equals mass times acceleration, right? So the acceleration of your satellite is the force divided by, by its mass, and the only force, again, would be this gravitational uh, force of a perfect sphere. So the acceleration of the satellite, which is the second derivative of its position re relative to time, would basically be given by this simple equation here. There's a constant mu divided by the square of uh, the distance of the satellite to the center of the Earth, so that's r sub s squared, and this p hat is a unit vector that points from the center of the Earth to where the satellite is, and that determines the direction of the acceleration. Of course, the Earth is pulling, the gravity is pulling the, the satellite towards the Earth, so it makes sense for the acceleration to be in minus p hat direction, right? It's, it's always getting uh, accelerated towards the Earth, right? Uh, mu in this equation is uh, itself a, a, a multiplication of two other constants. It's g times m, where g is the uh, universal gravitational constant, and m is the mass of the Earth, which is 5.9 times uh, 10 to the 24. There's a little typo here. Okay. And uh, this is easy. So if this was the ideal case, uh, uh, this you can actually analytically solve. And it turns out that the, the shape of the orbit becomes a perfect ellipse with uh, Earth at its focal point. Okay. Now, in reality, as I said, this is not the case. Well, for one, Earth is not a perfect uh, sphere. Also, its mass density is not uniform, as we know. And then there's a whole bunch of secondary forces affecting on your satellite. So in reality, the equation you need to solve to find the trajectory of, of, of your satellite is uh, this one given here, where the acceleration is given by this equation here, which has two terms. One is the gradient of V. V is the uh, gravitational potential of the Earth, right? 
And uh, then there's this A sub D, which is the kind of like the lump effect of all these secondary forces acting on your satellite. And you can just sum them up, make them this additional perturbing acceleration term that's, that's uh, getting added here. And uh, uh, just uh, remind that this, uh, the, the, the gradient is basically the vector of the first derivatives of V with respect to the three coordinates. So it's partial D, partial X, partial V, partial X, partial V, partial Y, partial B, partial z. And you evaluate that gradient at the position, the current position of your satellite, and that gives you basically what the acceleration is. Uh, this is called the two-body or the Keplerian equation of motion. In principle, you can solve this, right? It's still a um, uh, ordinary uh, differential equation. So you can, if you know v, you can find its gradient. Right? And let's say also A sub D is known, or you can ignore it if it's negligible. And then that gives you your acceleration. And if you integrate that once, you get velocity, right? Because uh, acceleration is a derivative of the velocity. And then you integrate again, you get position, right? So if you double integrate this, you can, in principle, get the position of your satellite. In practice, it is not done this way. And the reason is this V, the gravitational potential of the Earth, the actual uh, um, uh, basically, model of it is extremely complicated. So it's, it's this function given here, OK? So don't worry. We're not going to do this. I'm basically just, just put it in there to scare you off because it's this very complicated. I mean, it's not outrageous, uh, but it's this complicated function. It's modeled by what is called a spherical harmonics. Uh, it has an infinite number of terms in it. Um, you can always like approximate it with some finite sum. Um, these PLMs uh, are called Legendre polynomials. So those are some known polynomials. And then there's a whole bunch of like constants that go in there and a bunch of geometric uh, parameters like the alpha and the, and, and, and the R and so on and so forth. OK? So again, this is just, it's in there just so you know. It is doable, and the actual gravitational field of the Earth, it's very well known, very well studied, and in some applications, if need be, you can actually work with it, okay? But that's not how the GPS does, and the main uh, reason is computational complexity. I mean, this function, if you need to like constantly, uh, well, first find the, the gradient of it, and then double integrate to find a uh, position, it becomes uh, very computationally uh, expensive. So the way uh, it's done uh, for, for, the, for the GPS is actually um, uh, pretty elegant and, and, and simple. So what happens is that every ephemeris message, so the core idea here is, OK, if you look at very long time scales, the full trajectory of, of this uh, uh, satellite uh, around the Earth, is this complicated thing governed by the exact gravitational potential of the Earth and other perturbing forces? But on much shorter time scales, so if you just consider a few minutes, right, or seconds, you can very well approximate it by a perfect ellipse, right? So in, on a much shorter time scale, so again, the idea here is, Say this is the Earth, this is this satellite orbiting. So in a perfect case, it's, it's a perfect ellipsoid, right? In a non-perfect case, it's something else. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's like some deviations maybe or something. Maybe it's something like that, OK? But if you look at a very, very short time scale, like just around here, you can very well approximate the actual black trajectory by the blue uh, ellipse, right? So, and that's how the GPS works. As part of every ephemeris message, it sends just six parameters, six numbers basically, that uh, are the approximation of the actual trajectory of the satellite with an ellipse, right? And that is what the receiver uses to find the location of the satellite. Uh, and these are called the uh, orbital parameters. There's also a timestamp that the, uh, is part of the ephemeris message. So it basically tells you at this point in time, T0, my trajectory is very well approximated by, by an ellipse. And these are the six parameters you need to know 
to basically uh, uh, know the shape and orientation of, of, of this ellipse, okay? So, um, so those are the, the, basically the six uh, orbital parameters. And as I said, there is a timestamp as part of the ephemeris message. Uh, and the, the, that, that time is, is also called the, the, the epoch for uh, that message. And also, uh, remember that these uh, navigation messages are coming very slowly, right? So you might receive one every couple of minutes or, or, or maybe even less. So it is not, that's why the GPS satellite doesn't just send you a position. It just doesn't send you an X, Y, Z, right? Because the X, Y, Z is only valid at a single point in time, and then you need to, to extrapolate between the two uh, navigation messages. And if it's just one X, Y, Z, there's no way for the receiver to extrapolate. So that's why, instead, the, the satellite tells you the trajectory, right? It tells you the shape and orientation of this ellipse so the receiver can actually uh, extrapolate where the satellite is going to be or interpolate between two uh, um, um, navigation messages. And on top of that, just to make things more accurate, not only the satellite tells you the, the shape of this ellipse, it also sends you some secondary correction factors which tells you over time how these uh, orbital parameters change, and that helps the receiver to even more accurately uh, interpolate between, between two messages. So let's see what these six parameters are. Um, the first three uh, describe the shape of the ellipse and also where the satellite is on that elliptical trajectory, okay? Um, so Pretty simple, uh, it's an ellipse. There's very many different parameterizations for it. The one that uh, GPS uses is as part of the ephemeris, you get the uh, A or the semi-major axis of the ellipse. You also get the eccentricity, okay? So with that, you can perfectly basically find the shape of this ellipse and also where the Earth is. Uh, that's the focal point, right? So you just need to know A and the eccentricity, and that's it. Uh, but you also, the satellite needs to tell you at this time T0, where am I on, on this elliptical trajectory? And uh, the, 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 the velocity of the satellite on this is not constant, okay? Again, there's different parameterizations that you can use to basically uh, find where uh, the satellite is. The one that uh, is used by the GPS, it's called the tau or the time of perigee. So on this uh, elliptical trajectory, there's a point P here, which is the closest point to the Earth on, on the trajectory. So that's called the time of perigee, uh, point of perigee. And tau is basically the time it's going to take the satellite from this T0, which uh, is the transmit time, to get to the point of perigee. Right? So it tells you, okay, it's going to take me, for instance, I don't know, two hours to get to this point, P, on the trajectory. And with that, using that and some simple math, the receiver can back out where exactly the satellite is on the trajectory at time T0 and also uh, extrapolate because it knows the trajectory, it knows where it is on it right now, and also it can basically... Uh, tell how it's going to move over time. Only short periods of time, right? Remember, because over long periods, this, this trajectory is not going to be valid. This trajectory is only valid for minutes, right, or seconds. But still, it's, it's pretty good uh, for, for, for those kinds of, of calculations. Yes? How does the satellite know of the point of perigee? Oh, excellent question. So the question is, how does a satellite know the point of perigee? Um, so um, this is where um, I think I, I, I very briefly mentioned that there's a very important part of the GPS system, which is the, the, the ground system. There's these network of ground stations that monitor the satellites and constantly communicate with them. So that's actually, it's told uh, by, by, by the ground system, the satellite. A, a lot of these orbital calculations are, are, are done on the ground and then they're transmitted to the satellites. Uh, so so that's, that's basically uh, how, it's, how it's done. Yeah. But would it require too many resources for um, that ground 
ground system to keep track of the location of all the satellites? Uh, it kind of does. So in terms of, uh, again, the question was, does it, does it take too many resources for the GPS ground system to kind of track all these satellites and, and you know, tell them the, all the uh, trajectory information? It kind of does. It's not outrageous. Again, like by today's standards, we're talking about solving system, uh, simple uh, differential equations and, and things like that. So by today's standards, not really. In the 70s, yes, it was considered kind of like a heavy operation. But again, uh, remember that there's only like 30 something satellites in orbit. And there's a lot of ground stations. And uh, so if you kind of like distribute the compute uh, among them, it's not that I mean, these days, these kinds of, the, of, of calculations can run on a cell phone, basically. So again, in the 70s, yes, maybe it was considered kind of like compute heavy, but today, not really. Uh, but ground stations do a lot more than just this. So this is part of what they do, but there's a whole lot of like other stuff that the, that the GPS ground system does. Okay, so, so far, these three parameters, the A, the E, the, the, the uh, uh, major axis, the eccentricity, and the time of perigee describe the shape of this elliptical trajectory and where the satellite is on it. Okay, but that's not enough because remember we are in, in in a three D space, so we also need to know the orientation of this ellipse with respect to the Earth. Right. So if you will, you need three more parameters, kind of like a, a, a pitch and a roll and a yaw, so three angles to describe how this elliptical plane is oriented, right? And that's the other three, uh, basically, uh, orbital parameters that uh, the, are part of the ephemeris message. Again, there's many different uh, formulations you can use to describe the orientation of the ellipse. Uh, again, um, for instance, the a, a pitch roll and a yaw is a perfectly valid uh, parametrization, uh, but that's not what the GPS uses. It uses something slightly different. Here's a picture that um, kind of describes, it's three angles, they're called I, uh, big omega, and, 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 and little omega. And what they are is, let me maybe, um, add some color to the picture. So here you have two planes. This one that I'm highlighting in red is the uh, equ equatorial plane of the Earth. And the other one, let's keep it black, that's the plane of the elliptical trajectory of the, of the satellite. So we want to kind of uh, describe the orientation um, between the two. So the I is the um, angle between the uh, equatorial plane and the orbital plane, so that's this angle. So if you look at the two surface normals of the two planes, that's the angle I, okay? And then uh, big omega, it's uh, the longitude angle of the ascending node. And the ascending node is basically, if you look at this, let me use a different color here. Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, basically elliptical trajectory, let's say that's a, a trajectory of the uh, satellite, at some point, it's going to cross the orbital plane uh, of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the equatorial plane of, of, of the Earth. And that point uh, is called the ascending node. The one where it, it goes from uh, underneath it to above it, that's called the ascending node. And if you calculate the longitude of that, that is your big omega. So that's the second angle. And the third one, little omega, is the angle between the ascending node and the, 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 the vector that points to the point of perigee of the, of the orbital um, plane. Again, um, this is a kind of a thing you have to kind of look at it a little bit and then uh, it becomes clear exactly what the three angles are. Again, it's just one parametrization to describe the 3D orientation of the orbital plane. Okay, so, so those are the, basically the six parameters that are in, in every ephemeris message. Um, and uh, uh, these parameters, again, remember the, the, the six orbital parameters, they're exact only at time t0, which is the, the transmit time of the navigation message. And if, if you deviate from t0 because of these perturbing forces and other effects, your orbital parameters can change. Okay, and that's why, uh, as, as part of every ephemeris message, there's also correction factors that describe how these uh, six parameters are going to change over time, and then the receiver can also apply the correction factors as it's uh, interpolating uh, the position of the satellite between two navigation messages. Okay, so you get something exact at time zero, and then 
from this time zero to the, to the arrival of the next epoch uh, or, or, or uh, navigation message, you use your uh, correction factor, and by you I mean the receiver uses the correction factors to constantly basically track the position of the satellite in orbit. Okay, um, two questions. Why not send ephemeris messages very frequently? Why is it so slow? Send it fast and then we don't need to apply these correction factors. And it's for a very practical reason because it becomes too computationally expensive for the satellite if it needs to like constantly uh, communicate uh, this. And again, uh, when it comes to satellites, uh, power consumption is always a, a very, very big uh, constraint. And that was a design decision that was made by the uh, GPS design engineers. The other question, which we kind of already answered, is uh, why not, why doesn't the, the receiver integrate the fully perturbed equation of motion uh, to find the satellite orbit uh, trajectory? And again, that's too computationally uh, uh, expensive for the receiver. Okay? So for these two reasons, uh, basically the design decision was made to describe uh, the, the trajectory with the six orbital parameters plus the correction factors and then send them on kind of like a, a slow, uh, over slow intervals. Any questions? Okay, um, I, I, I really hope you, 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 you stop me uh, when things don't make sense because uh, uh, it's really important. I mean, it's, it's, it's my job to make sure when you walk out of the door, stuff we talked about made sense. So if it doesn't, please stop me and we can talk about and clarify things. And uh, don't, don't be shy to really just flat out tell me, hey, this, this doesn't make sense. And uh, I'll, I'll try to, to clarify. But um, so, uh, so far, again, we said there's, there's two things that the receiver needs to estimate before it can uh, start localizing itself. And one was the position of the satellite or each satellite in orbit. And we, we talked about it. Uh, so that's, that, that was the first item that's checked now. And now we are going to talk about how these ranging codes work and how time of flight estimation is done using them. Okay, Here I'm going to need, um, uh, it's going to become a little bit math heavy and I really need uh, your full attention because this concept that we are going to talk about now goes way beyond GPS. It's, it's a very core idea that we introduce it in GPS, but we're going to see it again and again in class. And generally for sensing, this is one of those really core, uh, very interesting ideas. So um, uh, let's uh, kind of like focus on it together. And again, at any point, if it, things don't make sense, stop me uh, right away and let's talk about it. So let's first build a, a simplified signal model uh, for time of flight estimation. So we have a, a GPS satellite that's transmitting a signal. And right now, we're, we're completely abstracting out what the specifics of the signal is. We called it ranging codes, but it can be anything right now. Some X of T is transmitted. It's a waveform, right? And then it gets some time tau to reach the receiver. And the receiver receives the Y of T, which is X of T minus tau. So it's some delayed version of T. And it also gets attenuated. So for completeness, we have included this alpha parameter, which is an attenuation factor. Okay, Very generic model. And uh, the job of the receiver is to basically estimate tau. What is the time of flight? Now, uh, usually, we, uh, any receiver um, to do DSP or any type of uh, like algorithms, it works with discrete signals. So the, the signals are sampled, basically. And let's say you have some sampling frequency f sub s or a sampling time t sub s, so f is 1 over t. And then we, you work with the discretized signal. So you get x of k, which is x of k times your sampling uh, interval, k times ts. And then y of k is alpha x of k minus n sub tau. This n sub tau is kind of like the discretized time of flight. Uh, so it, it's going to be the floor of tau over your sampling interval, ts. OK? So uh, that's kind of like super simplified uh, already signal model that we can work with. And uh, let's frame an estimation problem uh, using this. So you're the receiver. You have measured a y of k. Right? And let's say you also know what signal was transmitted. 
X of K is known to you. So you have previously agreed with the transmitter uh, that this is the exact waveform X of K that you're going to transmit, and we are not going to change that. Okay. Now you want to estimate the attenuation and the time of flight, n sub tau and alpha. Uh, attenuation for GPS, it doesn't really matter. There is nothing useful you can do with it. But as we see, it's just a byproduct of, uh, of this estimation problem. It just comes out of the equations. In some other applications, it might be interesting to know what the attenuation was. For GPS, we only care about time of flight. How do we do this? We can frame a least squares problem. So basically, now you have this uh, model, right, which is alpha times x of n minus n sub tau. And you want to fit the model to your measurements, which are y case, right? How do we do that? So uh, one way is uh, basically to minimize the mean squared error between your measurements and the signal model, right? So you sum over all k's. You subtract y k from uh, the, basically this fit, which is alpha x of k minus n. You square all the error terms, sum them up. That's your mean squared error. And then you want to pick alpha hat and n hat that minimize your mean squared error, right? Yes? Um, so on the last slide, you said tau was the time of flight. Yes. And on this page, you're using n sub tau. Yes. Uh, like, is there a difference between the two? Uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, on this slide, we said time of flight is tau. And then I kind of like changed to, to, to n sub tau, and are these different or, or related? They're related. So as we discretize the signal or sample it with some sampling interval t sub s, as it's written over here, basically n sub tau is, is the discrete index that corresponds to the, to the time of flight, right? Um, so, so that's how the, it's, it's like the discrete equivalent of your, your, your um, time of flight, basically. Um, OK. So, so, so this is basically our optimization problem. If we solve this and minimize this objective function, uh, the alpha and n that minimize this are going to be our least squares estimates of the time of flight and the attenuation. So let's solve this together. First thing is we expand this. It's uh, just a squared term. So as you expand it, you get three terms, right? You get sum of y squared. Uh, you get alpha squared times uh, sum of x squared, or x minus n squared. And then you get the cross term, which is uh, minus 2 alpha uh, summation yk, xk minus n. OK? Uh, first term does not depend on n or alpha. So this one, you can just uh, ignore it, the y squared term, right? And uh, what we get then is this equation here. And here I also have, have done a little thing. I flipped the sign inside and then changed min to the max. Uh, just for mathematical convenience, there's really no uh, scientific reason behind it, but just to uh, make the notation a little easier. OK, so, so this is what we want to minimize, right? It's our objective function. And let's first estimate alpha. And the way you do it when a function is given and you want to uh, min maximize or minimize it, you take the derivative, set it to 0. So let's take the derivative with respect to alpha, set that to 0. This is the equation you get for your alpha hat or the least squares estimate to alpha. Um, and as you solve this, so it's 2 times uh, this um, yk times summation yk times xk minus n minus 2 alpha hat times summation of x squared. So your alpha hat becomes basically this expression. Okay? So this is the least squares estimate of the attenuation. Right? Uh, now, what we really, really care about is the n hat or n hat tau. So to find that, you can plug this alpha hat back into this equation here and then solve for n hat. Right? Um, plugging it in, it in uh, things really simplify very quickly um, as, as, as you plug that in. And uh, basically, your n hat becomes uh, the argmax of this function here. OK? And if you look at this function here, uh, something is interesting. So it's a ratio. The numerator is the square of the summation yk times x uh, uh, k minus n. And then the denominator is summation over k of x squared k minus n. The denominator re uh, here is uh, really the energy in your transmit waveform x, 
or a delayed version of it, right? So K minus N, minus N is just like kind of just shifting or offsetting or delaying your signal, and then you're is squaring it and summing it up. So that's the total energy in your transmit signal, and it really does not depend on n. If you delay a signal, the energy in it does not change, right? So you can ignore the denominator and just go find the max of the numerator, right? Um, so, so, and that's what you do, and then your basically estimate of the time of flight, or n hat, becomes the arc max of this function, which we call ryx of n, and this is the cross-correlation of your received signal y and the transmitted waveform x, which is basically this, this sum here, right? Uh, which is the same sum that was on top here. We have just renamed it, called it ryx, and it's sum over k, yk, xk minus n. This should look familiar from, um, say, maybe a signal processing course that you've taken. It's awfully close to the, the correlation between x and y. Not exactly the correlation, though. There's like a minus sign change somewhere. I'll let you figure out like the exact difference. But basically, it's kind of like the correlation of x with uh, uh, x of n with y of minus n or some, something like that, like you flip one and then do the, the, do the correlation. The point is, it's, it's, it's kind of like a linear filter, right? Um, um, you have your y, you have different x with different delays, uh, right? And then you kind of uh, multiply and, and sum over k. And then what you want to do is you want to square to the sky and find the value of n that maximizes it, right? So if you calculate your ryx, and then square it, then you have this function of n, and then you can just look at this function and find where there is a peak, and the index for that peak basically uh, gives you your time of flight delay, right? There's one more simplification we can do, and that's the fact that we know y is just a scaled and delayed version of x, right? From the physics of our problem, we know y is just alpha times x of n minus some n, uh, n tau. So using this information, and if you plug that y, or that model for y into this, this cross-correlation basically just becomes uh, the autocorrelation of x with itself, right? So what I'm doing here just, just to be very concrete, I'm setting this equal to sum over k. For y, I'm plugging in alpha x of k minus n sub tau, and then that's multiplied by x of k minus n, right? Alpha as a constant comes out, and then what's under the summation is just the autocorrelation of x that is shifted by n sub tau, right? So just to summarize, now, now we basically have a procedure or an algorithm to find uh, time of flight, right? So here's kind of like a high level summary of it. A signal y is received, right? And then you correlate that. And by correlate, I mean that equation that we just looked at, that the summation of, of y and, and, and x of k minus n. So you correlate that with x of n, which is the waveform that the transmitter and the receiver agreed on. We know that was uh, the transmit. So you do that correlation. You get this correlation function out. It's a function of n, right? And you can, take, you can square it or just take the absolute value of it uh, and then find the maximum value or find the peak in this correlation and the n, or the index, that is the peak, that is your n hat, uh, which is basically the, discrete, the discretized time of flight. And then what is, uh, if you want to change that uh, or convert that from an index to an actual time, we said that tau hat is n hat tau times your ts, which is your, your sampling interval, basically. Right? Uh, so that's, that's the procedure. This is also, uh, in, in, in communication theory, this is, a uh, very well-known technique for uh, receiving signal packets. It's called matched filtering, right? Uh, so in communication systems, this is uh, used very often. Um, now, here's what is very interesting. So as we did this derivation, uh, we did not make any assumption about what x is, right? So we completely abstracted out the specifics of x of t or x of n, uh, the discrete version of it. 
but it, so, so in general, it can be anything, right? The receiver and the transmitter can agree on any waveform they like and use that for, for, for this time of flight measurement. But from this procedure, now that we have an algorithm, that helps us decide what is a good choice for x. What, are, what properties should x have to make this procedure better, more robust, and easier to do, OK? And um, so, so at, at a very high level, there's this function that comes out of the correlator. We call it like uh, ryx of n, right? Which is, as we said, just a scaled n offsetted version of the autocorrelation of x. So it's alpha times rxx of n minus n sub tau. So if you were free, and then what, what, the way you find n sub tau is that you look at the, let me use a different marker here. You look at the um, absolute value or the square of this. Let's ignore alpha, right? It's just a constant. We don't care about it. We, we care about finding this, this n tau. So as a function of n, if I plot, say, the absolute value or the absolute value squared, let's just plot the absolute value for now. Apps of Rxx of n minus n sub tau, right? Um, it's going to be some function, and hopefully it has some peak. And where this peak is, is my n hat of tau, OK? This is kind of the ideal. So, so the ideal function you want here is something that has a very sharp peak where your actual uh, n hat is and is almost zero everywhere else. And mathematically, that's called a delta function, right? So if you can find an x with an autocorrelation that is very close to a delta function, so it has a very sharp, large peak, and what we call the side lobes, which is the stuff here and here is very low, ideally zero, that would be very easy uh, for this procedure. If, if you have some other x where uh, has like very large side lobes and a peak here, these side lobes can be troublesome, right? So because we are free to choose any x, we should find one with what we call very good autocorrelation properties. And good autocorrelation properties, again, is sharp peak and very low side lobes, as close to a delta function as possible. And then that makes our lives really, really easy when it comes to time of flight estimation. Now, it turns out that uh, these ranging codes that, for instance, GPS uses are exactly chosen according to this criteria. These are these uh, basically uh, functions that have really, really good autocorrelation properties, right? And uh, Generally, there is a family of waveforms that are called pseudo-random noise, or PRN, sequences. And uh, these all have very good uh, autocorrelation properties. Uh, and uh, from this family of um, PRN sequences, the specific ones that GPS, for instance, uses, they are called maximal length sequences, or MLS, or also M sequences. And uh, those are kind of like a subcategory of, of, of PRNs that the GPS uses. Again, exactly for, for this reason, that they have very good, as we see, we'll see in a minute, autocorrelation properties. But also, they have some other uh, good properties. They're very, very easy to generate, almost free to generate, uh, using just a very simple linear feedback shift register. As I'll show you, you can generate these codes. And uh, if you have a shift register with n bits, that generates a code of a length 2 to the n minus 1. Uh, that's just from the mathematics of it. And uh, here, now you can sort of connect two dots when we were talking about these ranging codes like the CA or the PY, everything, all the number of chips and so on was a multiple of 10, 1023, right? And that's where uh, the number is coming from because these use M sequences uh, that uh, are, uh, have, have 10 bits, and 2 to the 10 minus 1 is 1023. And, and that's the length of or the number of chips in these codes. 
Um, there's, there's beautiful, beautiful mathematical theory behind these codes, and uh, there's just like uh, so many very interesting things about them. You're going to barely scratch the surface. Um, I, I know people who have done their entire PhDs on, on, on these codes. Uh, we're not going to go that deep, of course. But I, I want to tell you a little more about them. Uh, let's first start with what is a linear feedback shift register and how do we generate uh, these codes. Here's a very simple example. So we're going to generate a 15 chip code. So that's 2 to the 4 minus 1, uh, which based on what I said, you need a length for linear feedback shift register. Okay. So this is how it operates. So the shift register here is just have basically uh, four uh, memory bits. So it only takes four bits of memory. Right? And you initialize it with four bits. Uh, we start with 1, 1, 1, 1. Right? That's the initial state. And then you take feedback from, uh, uh, say, two of these uh, uh, memory bits, and uh, modulo 2 add them and feed it back to the input. Right? So at each clock cycle, what happens is that every bit is shifted to the right. So you go right, right, right. And then you push out one bit, and that's your code waveform X of T coming out. And then uh, the input is, is coming from this feedback. So after the first clock cycle, you generate the first chip of your code, which is this one coming out. And then what uh, you push into the A3 is modulo 2 added of A1 and A0. They're both 1. So you push in a 0. And then you just continue. Right? And what comes out of it is, again, uh, of course, the first four bits are going to be all ones, because that's how we initialized the shift register. And then after that, it's going to basically, based on the feedback, like uh, go to zeros and ones. So it generates this thing for you, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. But the point is, it repeats with a period of exactly 15. So if you look at the first 15 bits, uh, and we call that a code word here, then it starts to repeat. So infinitely uh, repeats the exact same code of length 15 for you over and over again. So this is just to illustrate that it's very, very easy to generate these codes, right? Almost, almost free. Um, I mean, in, with today's computer standards, this is literally free, OK? Um, what's also important is that this, this, this feedback, like here, we have taken the feedback from A1 and A0. Uh, this is not random. Right? Uh, so you need to take your feedback from very specific bits in the shift register to get an M sequence out with the good properties that we want. And uh, there's ways of like finding for a given length what are the, the, the feedback taps that you need. And there's tables that, that tell you that. So for instance, in the, in the previous slide, if you go to uh, this, this hyperlink here, uh, it's, it's a very interesting uh, website that tells you, uh, I want to generate a 1023-bit uh, M sequence. And it tells you what a, a specific feedback taps you need to use for your shift register. And then you can generate that. Another thing to note, which is also practically extremely important for GPS, is that say here, for instance, we are generating 15-chip uh, 15, 15 uh, M sequence. Um, it's not unique. So you can have different 15-chip M sequences uh, with different, basically, uh, uh, shift register feedback taps. And the autocorrelation of, of those different 15-chip M sequences are all at exactly good at this, or identical to each other. They're all very good. But the cross-correlations are very low. And that's where these codes are like almost orthogonal. If, if we think of this uh, cross-correlation as kind of like an inner product between the two, um, the cross-correlations of different M sequences with, different number, uh, with the same number of chips is, is very low, close to in the, in the limit that the codes become very long. It actually approaches 0, which I'll tell you it's an important property. So just as a summary, uh, why? GPS uses M sequences. They have lots and lots of interesting properties, but specific to GPS, they're very easily generated. You can generate them in hardware or in software, almost for free. Uh, as I'll show you in a minute, they have very good autocorrelation properties with very low side lobes, as we want for, to do uh, time of flight uh, estimation. 
and different uh, M sequences or MLSs of the same length have very small cross correlations. So they're almost orthogonal. And that's how the receiver can distinguish the signals between uh, different GPS satellites, because each satellite transmits a unique uh, M sequence for you. So let's look at the autocorrelation of these M sequences. Uh, remember that we use BPSK modulation uh, for these signals. So we map the 0 and 1 bits to plus 1 and minus 1. Right? That's how they're transmitted. And let uh, uh, T chip be the duration of one, uh, one chip of your code. And then we're going to uh, have, uh, we're going to uh, uh, sample it, right? So we work with discrete signals. And let's say you get M samples per chip. Um, so visually, basically, what we have is, let's say, this is your code waveform. And this here is going to be your T chip, right? And say if, uh, for instance, M equals 3. So if you sample it at 3 samples per chip, you get like 1, 2, three samples for this chip. And all of these are going to be, for instance, plus one. OK? That's how the sampling works. So x of n, again, is uh, x of n times ts, which in terms of the t chip and the m is x of n t chip over m. And then the n varies from 0 to m times n minus 1. Big n is the total number of chips. m is the number of samples per chip. So uh, your index varies from 0 to m times n minus 1. Now, um, to simplify our notation, let's uh, call m times n k. Uh, so k is the total number of samples in the discrete uh, 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 code, basically, after sampling at m samples per chip. And then uh, we can uh, find the autocorrelation function here. Because these uh, signals are periodic, right? So it, it has 2 to the n minus 1 chips, and it just repeats as the uh, shift register operates. Uh, we don't need to like find an infinite sum for the correlation. We just uh, sum over one period. And it's called the cyclic autocorrelation uh, for, the, for that reason. So we just take one period of your x of n, uh, vary k from 0 to big k minus 1. And then um, we're finding the autocorrelation of x. So you multiply x of k by x of k minus n. But for this k minus n, just so that it doesn't go out of bands of, of one period, we do that modulo k, right? So as you go outside the one period, you just wrap around your, your index. So, so we are always bound to just one period of the signal. And that is basically your autocorrelation function. Now, uh, as you do the math and, and find this function, it becomes uh, this discrete triangle function, which is very interesting. So for n equals 0, you get a value of 1. So if you plug n equals 0 into this equation, the value of the autocorrelation is exactly equal to 1. And then as you deviate n, your index, from 1, go to positive or negative side, uh, as you see, it linearly decreases. So that's where this triangle uh, happens. And then if your n is uh, uh, um, uh, basically bigger than uh, m minus 1, you get this constant side lobe level, which is negative 1 over n. And n, remember, is the total number of chips in your m sequence. So as you increase n, your side load levels become smaller and smaller. And in the limit of like very large codes, they actually approach 0. So you almost get like a perfect triangle with 0 side lobes as the, as the correlation function. OK, so um, one important uh, thing about this function, again, because we are working with periodic signals, the autocorrelation function also is periodic with a period of k, where k is the total number of samples in one period of your uh, code uh, or sampled code. So rxx of n plus a multiple of k is exactly equal to rxx of k. Um, and uh, the, uh, for the cyclic uh, correlation, uh, again, it's, it's, it's like a, a linear operation. So if you shift your uh, x, for instance, by some n0, uh, the autocorrelation of, of uh, also gets shifted uh, by, by the same uh, n0. That's just a property of, uh, of this linear filter, basically. Um, OK, so this is basically here. We are, I'm reiterating the same fact that the minus 1 over n is kind of like your side lobe level for these codes. And uh, as you increase n, 
which is the number of chips, you get smaller and a smaller side lobes. So just to compare, your course acquisition code, for instance, remember uh, it had 1023 bit, uh, chips. Uh, so your side lobe level is minus 1 over 1023, already pretty low. But if you just compare that to PY, which is the military code, and that had 6 times 10 to the 12 chips, it has much, much, much lower side lobe. And that's why the military GPS gets better SNR, um, because it's less, the correlation functions are kind of less noisy, right? Now graphically, this is perhaps this is the easiest uh, way to see what's happening here. So uh, our, the 15 chip uh, um, code that we generated using the shift register in a couple slides before. Let's sample that at four samples per chip, and then we find the autocorrelation function of it, and that's this is Rxx of n as a function of n, and it's exactly the properties that we want, right? You get very sharp peak at zero, and that's your triangle function right there. You see the samples linearly drop as you go away from uh, zero, and then you get this side lobe level which in this case is exactly minus 1 over uh, n, which is 15. Okay? So, so, so that's, that's that. Now, just to show you why these codes are magical, I mean, we call them pseudo-random noise. So it kind of the name is misleading because it, it suggests that they're just like random bits, right? So let's generate a 15-chip random binary sequence. You go on Python, you use your rand function, binarize it to zeros and 1, 15 bits and then sample that at four samples per chip, and then find the autocorrelation function of that, and you get something like this, okay? Well, yes, you still have the peak is at zero, sure, but look at the side lobe levels here and compare that to the M sequence. Uh, I mean, it's day and night different, right? I mean, assume like how much SNR gain you get. Again, remember, to find time of flight, you're searching for this peak. Right? So if your side lobes are too high, there's going to be noise and non-idealities and non-linearities added that you know, corrupt the signal. So if you don't have a very solid foundation for your autocorrelation to start with, as you add noise and other non-idealities, non it's just going to make it very, very hard for you to find that peak. So that's why you don't want to work with random sequences. You want to work with these codes that are, have really, really good uh, correlation properties to to start with. Okay, um, one more thing. So let's look at uh, one more example. Here we are working with slightly longer codes, so 31 chips. So these are coming from a five bit, is that far? Yeah, five bit chip register. And now we are generating two of them. Okay, so we, we do two different shift registers with feedback tabs. Let's say we go to that website that I, sh uh, there's a link. You go where it says, okay, five, five bit shift LFSRs and you choose two of the uh, basically feedback tab values that it gives you. You uh, generate those uh, shift registers and then you get an X1 and an X2. Both are 31 chips and we sample them at three samples per chip. Okay, if you find the autocorrelation of x1, so rx1, x1, or rx2, x2, they're identical. Exact same, both give you this very nice triangle, right? Sharp peak with side lobe level that is minus 1 over uh, uh, 31, right? Now, if you look at the cross correlation of the two, so you find rx1, x2, you would see that it's not exactly zero everywhere but it's pretty low. It doesn't have like a sharp peak or anything like that. So that, this is that principle of orthogonality of these codes. So now from this, you can kind of imagine if you are a receiver and there's this like 30 something satellites in orbit, each is transmitting a different M sequence and you know exactly all the M sequences, but then you can build correlators and make the kernel of these correlators correspond to different codes from different satellites. And as you feed in your received signals, by this principle of orthogonality, each correlator just shows a peak for the code that corresponds to the kernel of the correlation. And it naturally filters out the interference from the other satellites for you. And uh, this is what is uh, the, the, the principle of basically code division multiple access that the receiver uh, the GPS system receivers uh, use, and that's how they can distinguish uh, signals from different satellites. Although they're transmitted at the exact same frequency, so you get a lot of, in principle, interference, uh, when you receive these signals, 
but uh, by, by uh, basically just using this almost orthogonality of the signals uh, through the correlators, you can completely separate them out. Okay, so uh, let's summarize. How does this time of flight ranging work uh, uh, um, for, for, for the receivers? So we start with the GPS satellite and let's look at the idealized scenario right now. So we're not accounting for timing offsets and a few other effects that I'll tell you. So let's say this is an ideal scenario. So the satellite transmits a unique code, X of T, at some carrier frequency F sub C, which is one of the five GPS frequencies. X of T and the carrier frequency are known to the receiver, right? And uh, what the receiver does is, as it receives a signal, it's, it's coming in modulated at F sub C, right? So it first demodulates the signal by the carrier frequency to bring it basically to baseband. And what it gives you is just some delayed version of X of T by time of flight. So receiver recovers this Y of T, which is X of T minus tau. And we're ignoring attenuation, right? Remember that there is some, some attenuation factor alpha here. It does not affect the GPS in, 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 in any, any way. So it can completely ignore that, assume there is no attenuation. We're just looking for a time of flight. And again, this is idealized scenario. So receiver has its clock uh, perfectly synchronized with the transmitter for now. So tau sub D is zero. We'll talk about that later. And uh, what the receiver can do is that it generates a local replica of the ranging code. Call that x, x hat of t, right? So x hat of t is exactly equal to x of t because x of t is known to the receiver. The clock is perfectly synchronized, so you can generate a, a local replica of the ranging code. And then what the receiver does is that it calculates the correlation between x hat, which is the local, local replica, and y of t, which is the delayed version of the code, and that correlation will have a peak exactly at the time of flight tau, right? Uh, or the, in the discrete version, it has a peak at the index that corresponds to the discretized time of flight. Um, so the, you find the peak, you find the index of the, of the correlation uh, for, for that peak, and then you estimate your, your time of flight tau hat is the receiver's estimate of the time of flight is just n hat times the sampling interval, which is, which is t sub s. And then you can convert uh, the time to the range using the time of flight principle. So you just multiply your tau hat by the speed of light, and that gives you the range, OK? Simple procedure. Uh, let's see how it works kind of graphically. So again, same, same idea. I'm just. Uh, uh, this is some pictures to, to illustrate. So your satellite is transmitting this code, uh, ranging code X of T, it's some M sequence. And this is star here is, is just for us to be visually, you know, track a reference point in time. There's no uh, physical significance to it, really. So that's X of T. What the receiver receives is X of T delayed by some tau, right? So your star shifts by tau seconds, right? But also, because the receiver is perfectly synchronized to the transmitter, it can generate a local replica, x hat, of the code, which is perfectly aligned with the satellite's version. Okay? For now, we are ignoring timing offsets. And then what you do is you, you look at the correlation of x hat with y, right? And that correlation, right now, there's no noise. Everything is ideal. Everything is perfect. So it gives you a perfect triangle function with a peak at n hat, which is your discrete time of flight. It's just tau over ts, a little floor of tau over ts. You find your n hat, multiply by ts, that gives you tau hat, multiply by c, that gives you range. So that's how ranging in an idealized scenario works. OK, now let's talk about a few non-idealities. The first one is, of course, which is the big one, is the fact that you never have your clock as a receiver perfectly synchronized with the GPS, right? So what happens in that scenario is that the local replica of the code that the, the receiver generates, is it is not perfectly aligned. It is offset by some tau sub d from the receiver. It's OK. You can still do everything we talked about. You can look at the correlation of your local replica with x, find the correlation peak, and convert that to a time of flight. But now you should remember that what you recover is not just the time of flight tau. What you recover is tau plus your timing offset, tau sub d. Right. So then when you convert that to range, when you multiply by, by, by the speed of flight, you don't get the physical range. You get what we call the pseudo range 
call it rho. So rho is c times tau hat, and tau hat in this case is the actual tau, the physical time of flight, plus your tau d. C times tau is the physical range r, and then you get this error term, which is c times tau d, that the receiver later needs to correct for, right? But for now, from these principles using these codes, you, the receiver recovers a pseudo range for every satellite, not the physical range. And next time I'll tell you how you can convert your pseudo range to a physical range. There's two more non-idealities, just to make things more complicated for the receiver that uh, I want to talk about. The first one is Doppler shift. So what Doppler shift is, is that in, in practice, the, neither the receiver, in most cases, and definitely not the transmitter are stationary, right? These are moving, and especially the satellite is moving at, at, at very high velocities. So they have some relative velocity, delta v, which is the velocity of the receiver minus the velocity of the satellite. Now, what happens in, in practice is that if there is a component of the velocity that is radial, and by radial I mean it's in uh, the direction of the line that connects the receiver to the transmitter. If that delta V has a radial component, that would cause, from the receiver's point of view, a shift in the carrier frequency, which is called the Doppler shift. And the Doppler shift is given by this expression here. So you take your delta V, you project it into the radial direction. So this, this R hat is a unit vector that points from the receiver to the satellite. And delta V, inner product with R hat, you kind of project that uh, uh, relative velocity to find the component of it uh, that is uh, radial. Divide that by the speed of light, multiply by your carrier frequency, and that is uh, the Doppler shift F sub D. So receiver, even if everything was perfect, it had like a perfect uh, crystal oscillator and there was no noise or anything, just because of the movement uh, from the receiver's point of view, the signal doesn't come at a carrier frequency of Fc. It comes at Fc shifted by the Doppler shift, okay? Uh, in reality, there's other things. There's like inaccuracies in the local oscillators that the receiver uses, add some timing jitter, um, so that also uh, kind of becomes uh, kind of like an apparent Doppler shift. And this effect can be pretty big. So for like typical velocities of GPS satellites and, 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 and uh, devices that uh, operate on Earth, F sub D can be as, as large as plus and minus 10 kilohertz, which is significant. Now what happens is that, uh, as I was describing this procedure of, of time of flight ranging, the first step for the receiver was to demodulate the received signal by F sub C to bring it to baseband, right? Now, if you ignore your uh, Doppler shift, if you just use the nominal carrier frequency, you don't bring your signal to baseband. There's gonna be some offset modulation by the Doppler shift, right? And that would significantly, almost entirely kill your SNR, uh, correlation SNR. Um, so it is essential for the receiver to also estimate the Doppler shift somehow and track it. And when it wants to demodulate, not just demodulate by the nominal carrier frequency FC, it should, it should uh, modulate by FC plus the Doppler shift to perfectly bring your received signal down to baseband and then do correlation on it, right? Super essential. So uh, just to summarize, uh, there's, there's, there's a receiver to find pseudo ranges it needs to do two things. It needs to find and, and, and track and compensate for Doppler shift, and uh, it also needs to find these uh, um, uh, time of flight plus its timing offset, tau plus tau d, uh, using the correlation principle, and then it can recover a pseudo range to each satellite, and then it can use the pseudo ranges to basically find uh, uh, time of flight. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it can use the pseudo ranges to, to localize itself. And uh, that would be the next uh, topic we talk about. There's a third complication here, and I'll briefly mention it and complete it next time because we are running out of time. And that has to do with the fact that uh, when I introduced this concept of correlation, I told you that it is because we are transmitting signals periodically, your correlation function is also periodic, right? We just calculated over one period of the code but it is a periodic function, right? So uh, your RxX, if you add any multiple of the code length to the index, 
the value doesn't change. So graphically, what happens is, is if I uh, do this R, Y, X hat, which is the correlation of my received signal with the local replica of the code, if I calculate that and plot that, not over just one period, just k samples, but over like all possible values of n, it's a periodic function, which means the peak also repeats uh, every k samples, right? So you don't get just one peak. If you look at an extended uh, uh, um, base for this, this function, you actually get an infinite number of peaks. It repeats every k samples, which is the duration of your code. So then the question is, this idea of uh, range ambiguity is like, which of these infinite number of peaks is the real peak? Which of them corresponds to the actual time of flight? And then which are just artifacts of the math, right? It's very important because if you just pick the first one, you don't know, is that, is that real or is it just an artifact of the math? And next time I'll tell you how you disambiguate. There's a few different ideas for range disambiguation. Any questions before we quit? Yes? In like geostationary orbits, is the Doppler effect reduced or is it still present? Uh, it's still present um, because, of, well, first your receiver can move. You're in a car, you're moving, so, so, so that still uh, affects it. There is some very lucky situations that kind of like the, the, the two movements cancel each other or there is no radial component to it or something like that. But almost always there is some Doppler shift, yeah. Okay, I'll uh, see you next time. Thank you.